so this is the topic I was tasked to discuss with you, and I would also like to thank everybody who came before me because uh, we've discussed many of the elements that go into this uh, synthesis uh, in the in the days before this one. So. This is what I would uh, like to do. I'll, um, the, my research is really mainly on the West African monsoon, so uh, that will be most of the work that I will discuss is based on my research, but also the research of uh, Catherine, who comes after me, who works with Yohanan and, and me at uh, Le Monde, and many others, let's say. The wor work on uh, Eastern Equatorial Africa in this, um, we're talking about the decadal, decadal influences on these two uh, rainfall systems. The work on Eastern Equatorial Africa is very much the work of a colleague of mine at IRI, Brad Lyon. So, but what I will try to do is uh, try to bring some uh, synthesis to how we look at uh, these two rainfall systems, these two tropical climate systems, uh, in regards to decadal influences, influences on decadal time scale, which come from the oceans. So the decadal time scale is very much dictated by, uh, by the oceans and by variations on that time scale in the oceans. And um, if I can summarize, give you some of the conclusions already, it's mainly the Atlantic for the West African monsoon and the Pacific for Eastern Equatorial Africa. But I would also like to bring some uh, dynamics of uh, tropical climates to the discussion. So try to go through some of the basic um, uh, diagnostics of the variability that uh, allow us also to, to some extent to bring some coherence across time scales from uh, sub-seasonal to multi-decadal and uh, beyond. And uh, I just put in gray here anthropogenic influence because uh, the influence of the oceans on these climates can also uh, be used to argue for or against uh, anthropogenic influence. And so, how does, okay. So a lot of the, the physics of this and the theory of this has, has to do with deep convection and vertical instability and what sets the instability that, that uh, triggers deep convection in these tropical regions. And what is the role of the oceans? So what is the role of the oceans? At a very most basic, so this is just annual mean precipitation over Africa. And uh, so the two regions are the regions that I will be discussing are the regions in the two boxes here. <laughs> You can see based on climatology that we're talking about uh, margins of uh, climatological precipitation. So these are semi-arid regions, and if you've been there, you know that, I mean, like, as my colleague from Agrimet likes to say, Abdul Ali, it really doesn't rain there for eight, nine months of the year. So the moisture has to come from the oceans. So at a very ba most basic level, we understand that the oceans have a very important role to play in the climate of these regions. Okay, so I'll go through some of the steps here and some of the motions in, in, in the case of West African monsoon and then try to repeat the same uh, exercise for Eastern Equatorial Africa. So as has been pointed out already in uh, previous days, I mean, this is one of the really, when we talk about decadal variability and predictability, the Sahel is really the most outstanding case uh, of uh, observed decadal variability in the 20th century instrumental record. And so what you see here in the red is a, a time series of uh, the average of stations across the region from uh, GHCN, anomalies, standardized anomalies in precipitation for this uh, broad Sahelian region that was in that box that I showed on the map. And um, so you see, I mean, it's evident that there is multi-decadal variability and that there were decades of anomalously wet in the 50s and 60s, followed by anomalously dry, persistent anomalously dry in the 70s and 80s, and then perhaps some indication of a recovery in the most recent period. <clears throat> now, there was the, there's been a long-standing debate as to what caused these multi-decadal vari uh, variations, but I think now we can say with some certainty, based on ensembles of AMIP simulations, that uh, these variations were caused by the oceans. So take an atmospheric model, force it with observed sea surface temperatures, and you get something like the blue curve here. So knowledge of the observed global observed sea surface temperatures is sufficient to reproduce 
not just the decadal variations, I would argue, but also quite a bit of the inter interannual variations. Yeah, so that's where you are. I mean, and being, being that I work at IRI, this you can understand is the basis for seasonal predictions, certainly. Perhaps also, I guess, if we could do decadal predictions, then you, you can immediately see that there will be some value to, to those for this region. Uh, okay, so how do we understand the role of the oceans? Yeah, that's the question you sh one is prompted to ask here. Okay, it's the global oceans, but uh, which oceans and how does this uh, influence work? So yeah, I, I skipped a step here, but uh, if you look at, if you were to correlate the uh, time series like the ones showed in the previous map to sea surface temperatures, then you would see broad sensitivity of the uh, significant correlations of the rainfall time series to sea surface temperatures in all the ocean basins. And here I broke it down by time scale, if you wish, in, uh, into a long uh, you know, multi-decadal time scale and an interannual time scale. And the moment I do that, I can see that the interannual time scale is taken care of by ENSO. So here the blue means a negative correlation with uh, Sahel rainfall. So, uh, Positive anomalies where you see the blue mean drought in the Sahel. So El Nino typically uh, causes drought in the Sahel most of the times. That's the red bars on this plot. And if you're looking for an explanation for this multi-decadal uh, variation, then it's in the oceans around Africa. And so Indian Ocean warming that Roxy just uh, described is uh, definitely one component. And then the other component would be some, some kind of an interhemispheric gradient in the Atlantic. Okay, so a little bit of how this could work specifically to, well, not just the Atlantic, but let's take this uh, initial figure, which is the, I guess, the conventional wisdom about how rainfall varies in the Sahel. Where it says that um, if you have a gradient in sea surface temperatures of this nature, so with a cool North Atlantic with respect to a warmer South Atlantic, then uh, this interhemispheric gradient drives the latitudinal location of the intertropical convergence zone. And so when it's in this phase, the ITCZ shifts southward, and then you just uh, extrapolate this to the continent, and you get a dry Sahel. Um, so I would like to uh, offer a reinterpretation and a reinterpretation that uh, moves us in the direction also of trying to understand how climate change and warming may play into this. And the interpretation is as follows. It has two basic ingredients and, uh, that come from uh, the theoretical work of all these people plus a few more. Perhaps I should have included, for example, also Adam Sobel or Lorenzo Polvani and to how, so how does uh, tropical convection respond to these uh, very broad scale sea surface temperature variations. So one element is the global tropical oceans and you can think of El Nino as an analog. So what happens if you warm the global tropical oceans as happens during an El Nino event, then uh, what happens is that deep convection communicates that warming to the upper troposphere and so you affect the vertical stability by warming the upper troposphere. You make uh, environmental conditions uh, more stable. And so you, you up the ante for convection to be triggered then in places that are remote from that uh, deep uh, tropical convection that has increased or strengthened. So then that would drive uh, what we see as um, uh, widespread drought during the uh, development of an El Nino event. And so the second ingredient, and, and you, it would also, so that would be, for example, the element of uh, Indian Ocean warming affecting, uh, contributing to persistent drought in the Sahel. The second element is the moisture then. How do you change that uh, vertical stability? How can you counter that uh, increased stability that is uh, communicated by deep convection through upper tropospheric warming. And um, the, the idea here is that you counter it with uh, the moisture that comes from the local ocean. So in this case, the Atlantic. 
And so in this schematic of a, a cooler north to, uh, compared to a warmer South Atlantic, then the cooler North Atlantic is not able to meet that up -tenty that is driven by upper tropospheric warming because there's not enough moisture being driven into the monsoon. And so you end up with a, a drier Sahel in this configuration. Now, if the climate were not warming, then we wouldn't have to worry about this uh, increasing trend in the warming. So it's just that because we're in this transient warming that we have to consider the difference of the two. So when we consider the simple difference of these two um, oceanic influences, which is in the, then uh, just simply uh, uh, captured in the difference between north, uh, subtropical North Atlantic sea surface temperatures and global tropical mean sea surface temperatures, then we can explain the past variations. So what do I have here? I have these two elements here, global tropical sea surface temperature anomaly on the x-axis and North Atlantic sea surface temperature anomaly on the y-axis. And so you can see that uh, my wet years are, in, uh, are when nor North Atlantic is warmer than global tropics, so above this line, that's uh, full dots are positive anomalies. And conversely, the, the dry years are below the line, so North Atlantic not as warm or cooler than the global tropics. And uh, this on the right here is just how these years are distributed in time. So the blue dots are the wet epoch and the red dots are the dry epoch and now we're in this gray epoch where uh, things are somewhat more variable here up on top. So both North Atlantic and uh, global tropics warming. And now I just, uh, just to show that um, how, how do we string along this uh, convection that happens at very small spatial and temporal scales to Subseasonal uh, characteristics of rainfall to then seasonal and then uh, interannual, multidecadal, and so on. Here I broke down uh, rainfall into frequency on the left and intensity on the right, and this is stations from uh, the network of the National Meteorological Agency of Senegal. And so, same uh, depiction here, and what do we see now? That the wet years are characterized by more rainy days compared to the dry years. Okay, this is something that is well known. So um, the wet years, again, the 50s and 60s had more rainy days during the rainy season than the, than the dry years. And uh, now we're in this uh, upper right corner. So rainy days that are somewhat, somewhere in between, perhaps a little closer to the dry epoch than the, than the wet epoch in terms of number of rainy days. And what is intriguing here is that the intensity Actually, what it really shows is more of uh, more intense uh, rains, so more intense daily accumulation of rain that in some ways um, compensates for the fewer rainy days. So the recovery is really more of a recovery in the in, in, that is dictated by, the, by a slight increase in the intensity rather than in the number of days, which is interesting. I guess that's... Uh, it follows expectation from climate change, just generically speaking. I know that Gavin is going to say something about that for sure. <laughs> okay, so this, uh, it, it's, how am I doing with time? Yeah, okay, good. Uh, so we know this uh, very well. So this is the uh, time series of uh, ra uh, Sahelian rainfall. So again, the wet 50s and 60s the dry 70s and 80s, and now this variable period that we're in. So how do we explain this now coming, coming to decadal variations? Uh, and, but I really want to remark the fact that it's, uh, it was really persistently wet in the 50s and 60s and sort of persistently dry, and now we're in this uh, really uh, increasingly variable and uh, uh, epoch, which uh, again, uh, from the perspective of uh, trying to apply the climate science really makes for uh, an increased value, I would say, in, in, a, in a seasonal prediction uh, system that can uh, skillfully say something about uh, how do you go from uh, wet to dry year to year. Okay, so I'm superimposing now these uh, global, well, multi-decadal uh, oceanic influences. The blue curve is an index of uh, North Atlantic minus global mean, so something very much like an AMO or an AMV um, index. 
So North Atlantic uh, sea surface temperatures detrended by subtracting the global mean temperature. And so we see it has these nice uh, oscillations that we've seen already. The, um, the green curve, I should say, is a smooth version of Sahel rainfall. And then the red curve here is, broadly speaking, equatorial Indian Ocean uh, uh, index with the sign reversed. That's because the association is warming and dr with drying. So uh, I think you already get the sense that I can explain then the fact that it was persistently wet because both influences were in the direction of wet in the 50s and 60s. Whoops. Aye, aye. Now I'm in trouble. Persistently dry in the 70s and 80s because both influences were in that direction. And now we're in this phase because uh, there's opposition of the two influences. Okay, so that's um, the Sahel. Now let me try and wrap this up really quickly for Eastern Equatorial Africa, but there is an interesting, the interesting decadal to longer term uh, change and uh, question here is that uh, Eastern Equatorial Africa has been persistently dry for about a decade or so, but uh, long term projections say that it should get wetter. So how do we reconcile these uh, these two uh, elements. And I'm not going to try to do that, but uh, I'll just try and give an explanation for what's, for what's going on at present. So first, uh, interannual time scale. We under so here, are the, what, what are the local and remote basins in relation to Eastern Equatorial African rainfall? So uh, this is, um, for, so in observations, we see this relationship. We're talking here, this is the short rains, October, November, December. There's a relatively clear association with uh, ENSO, such that El Nino drives wet anomalies, but it's mediated by an Indian Ocean warming. So you get wet anomalies in Eastern Equatorial Africa during El Nino if the Indian Ocean warms. And uh, so this is in observations in the top. You get the same in Goga, which was already talked about earlier, global ocean, global atmosphere. But you don't get the same if you only have uh, tropical uh, Pacific warming. With only tropical Pacific warming, the atmospheric bridge would say dry eastern equatorial Africa. So you need this moisture. You, you could cast this as a, you need this added moisture that comes from the Indian Ocean that, supply, that is supplies into eastern Africa to get wet. Maybe I'll skip this, uh, but to say that there's also uh, this breakdown of the seasonal uh, rainfall into uh, frequency and intensity also works to some extent here, only now we're in the, say, let's say, in the mature phase of ENSO. So during El Niños, we get wetter conditions in Eastern Equatorial Africa because we have more rainy days. This is the stronger signal. And, but to some extent also more intense, but it's not as strong a, a signature. Okay, now on the Gettle time scale, this is what has happened. Uh, well, it's a broader, I mean, you can see the signature in Eastern Equatorial Africa, but the case I would like to make is that it's part of a, of a really a global signal that has to do with Pacific decadal uh, variations. So it's this, what uh, characterizes this persistence of dry now in Eastern Equatorial Africa is part of this step change that happened somewhere at the end of the 1990s. So this is an EOF that captures the broader picture, but that also includes Eastern Equatorial Africa. Uh, similar, uh, so this is, these are composites of sea surface temperature, precipitation and winds that go with this shift. So it's just simply the, the difference in the averages of these two periods. And again, you see, or I, you see what's, uh, What's popped out here is really the dominant, uh, I mean, the one ex, the, what seems to be the dominant influence here that can explain this shift is this Pacific signature or Indo Pacific signature. It's, uh, it can be, I, you know, characterized as the first EOF in this residual sea surface temperature. Once you've removed ENSO and global trend influences, then whether you do this calculation on the Pacific or on the Indo-Pacific, you get a time series like this red one here. It's really the red and the blue, so Pacific or Indo-Pacific give you the same multi-decadal variations here over the 20th century. 
And so what we witnessed uh, most recently is just the last shift here. And so the shift, I mean, in some ways, it's consistent with uh, the El Nino influence in the sense that uh, La Nina or uh, cool conditions in the eastern equatorial Pacific, which occur during La Nina, are associated with dry uh, eastern equatorial Africa. So I think, whoops, that's all I have. Yeah, that's all I have. So to wrap up, there is a, I, we can identify decadal uh, variations in the oceans that have influence on these two regions. And then we can also begin to tie to things together on, on, uh, that allow us to go for, across time scales from uh, subseasonal to multi-decadal. Thank you.